coming up today, it's a biohacking news episode. We are unpacking the controversial new study that you may have heard about on time-restricted eating. Is skipping dinner really putting your heart at risk or is there a little bit more to the story? Yeah, we'll be unpacking that. Some weird research. We'll also be looking at the new app that promises to guide us to healthier eating options. When you're out and about, you can now find a restaurant that doesn't give you seed oils and they don't cook with seed oils in the food. Is this a good idea? Is it even possible? Let's find out. And we're also examining a recent study that paints the UK as the second most miserable country in the world. What's going wrong? Is this really true? Can biohacking help? Yes, a new segment I'm trying out on Zestology, Biohacking News. Will it work? I don't know. Let's find out. The theory is that we focus on all this week's news in tech, supplements, research, events, and significant themes within the biohacking world with special guests to help. And I thought who better to help than the awesome podcast hosts of the Sweaty AF podcast, Joey and Lucy. I've been on their podcast before. It's so much fun and always enjoy hanging out with them together. And they do have a deep knowledge of the biohacking world themselves. And they are helping me unpack these news stories today. So let's go ahead and bring them on. Joey and Lucy, how are you doing? Good. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Very good, thanks. Have you had your ice bath, your sauna today already? We have. Have you? Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, terrific. How about you? What have you done today? I've not had a sauna or an ice bath today. And I've been a very bad biohacker because for lunch, I had far too many oat cakes. And then I was like, what am I going to have with the oat cakes? Oh, I couldn't oh, find anything. So I just <laughs> I found some organic jam with the oat cakes. I mean, it's just like terrible scenes. <laughs> Just keeping it real, keeping it real. Sugar and oats. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So just sugar and um, So you've got, you've got one of the ice baths. Tell me about the ice bath you've got at your house, because that sounds amazing. Oh, Betty. It's our brass Betty. <laughs> she was named immediately, and she is a stunner. She's one of the commercial size, isn't she? Yeah, she's one of Brass Monkey's commercial units, so she's big betty is a big unit she's a big <laughs> she's a big unit and fit a big unit um, in her yeah she takes you can be over five over six foot four so we can both fit in together so we sometimes we double dip which oh, we know terrific. Actually, but... <laughs> <laughs> she's gone there <laughs> how long oh it took me 35 seconds there we go <laughs> <laughs> oh brilliant yeah. no, it sounds really good what, what was the thing about the ice that it creates so it they have the patent on the so the side panels create sheets of ice and then it's the patent is on the temperature it sort of defrosts yeah. and then releases the ice sheet so then you get these beautiful corrugated ice sheets that float to the surface that you then have to break up oh lovely in it's I find it quite like meditative when you get in, you hear the ice mm -hmm. kind of clinking a little bit around you. It's quite, it's quite a sensory thing. Um, it's easier with the, I find it easier. Yeah. So we started off at around about eight degrees and the water alone kind of moves, moves around you a little bit too much, which makes it feel colder, but yeah. down at zero degrees we are now, aren't we? With we're the 0.5, yeah, so half so a degree. <laughs> Oh, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, amazing. Daily, daily, daily dose of ice. Did well. Somebody came and had a go in it the other week, and I was like, oh, it's as cold as the Arctic. And they were like, right, thanks for telling me that before I get in there. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. um, yeah. listen, thank you so much for, for trying this new feature out with me, the biohacking news feature, which is very experimental. Let's see if it's going to work. Um, but you are the perfect people to do it with. I so enjoyed recording your podcast with you. And in fact, the last time I saw you both, we were all in a sauna, sort of sweating. So this is a different format today. But um, <laughs> you were our first. Yeah. You were our first up. ever podcast guest. Yes. Was I really? You were. Um, so you hold a very special place in our hearts. 
Delight, <laughs> delighted to hear that. Well, we'll record again soon, as soon as I'm back in the UK. But let's start with this first item of biohacking news. Then I know one that you've both heard. Um, a study suggesting that intermittent fasting, this has been all over the papers over the last week or so, was associated with a 91% increase in the risk of cardiovascular death. And it's been all over the media. And the question that a lot of biohackers have been asking is, is it true? Because let's be honest, a lot of people in our world like intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating. And I've gone to Peter Atia, who's done this deep dive analysis on it. And he had a look at this study and he basically said the methodology wasn't right. And to decide whether people intermittently fast every day, they asked them to twice note down when they eat in a day, just twice. So for two separate days. And then they represented eight years of eating patterns from those two days. Now, also, he pointed out significant biases in nutritional self-reporting. And then the final thing he, he pointed out was that this is not a proper research study. It was just an unreported study, which basically um, draws sensational conclusions from incomplete and flawed data. But unfortunately, it's just had so much publicity. But by the time you come up with an intelligent, well-thought-out critique of this study, it's too late. What did you guys make of it? We we were talking about this yesterday because I you were. I intermittent fast. It works really well for me. I've done it for about four years now. Um, and I obviously, as a nutritionist, it's one of my hacks that I suggest people think about, experiment with, but always in quite a gentle way. So I look at maybe like a twelve-hour eating window. I think that I think this study was on based on an eight-hour eating window, but Which I think. I do. Yeah, it's what you do. And also like for women, like obviously when I work with women, like hormonally, you have to con have considerations and it's a really personalized thing. And as with all of these like random studies that get done, I think people just really pick out the negative. I think that's the same on anything. I think that's the same on like social media stuff. People just pick on the negative things and that's what gets publicized and that people run with and actually there are probably like hundreds of studies done on intermittent fasting of how it benefits longevity yeah. and loads of other things there are previously health. yeah Tons. and so yeah people hang their hat don't they on this that is the point that a lot of people have made you can find a study to back up almost anything but actually in this instance as peter atia said he said this these results aren't even in their finished form and they're being used to scare people away from time restricted eating, which is, you know, quite a proven weight loss strategy. It's a proven health strategy. I also intermittent fast, and it feels I, I wait until at least ten thirty to eat my oats and jam. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> Joey, Joey is like the biggest oat hater. Oh, she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> um, but also, yeah. you know, who funded the study? Well, no, I don't. Oh, so, God, yes, I do. No, but tell me, tell me. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I don't. It was a genuine question. I just, you know, it's like all those Netflix shows about you shouldn't eat X, Y, Z. They're always funded by people who want you to eat X, Y, Z, right? R right. Well, it was, a, it was from a group of researchers who presented unpublished and therefore not peer-reviewed data. But I think even this group of researchers came from a body that is quite sort of controversial in the health world because of their links to the pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, a lot of controversy. And it's a shame, actually, because intermittent fasting really does help a lot of people. Um, and um, by the time you've had this discussion, it's too late. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People are scared off. And then I think it... I then think it like feeds into the whole thing about biohacking and people getting scared of it. Well, and and we, people thinking that we're all extremists, yeah, which yeah. is absolutely not the case for a huge proportion yeah. of biohackers. Yeah. It is a very small number yeah. that's really extreme. Yeah. Wait there a sec. Someone's decided to mow a lawn outside my window, so I'm just going to go and shut the door. One sec. <laughs> Um, Good to keep the lawn tidy, though, isn't it? <laughs> I could hear you chuntering away. I couldn't hear what about, but I, I, I presume you were taking the piss out of me. No, <laughs> she's gone straight to the filth. 
<laughs> oh right, okay. Cool. okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll listen to it, and I might not edit edit it out. That'll serve you right. <laughs> um, good. So, um, you find with your clients generally that intermittent fasting sort of seems to work, and that definitely seems to be the way in the nutritional world. Yeah, yeah. There are so many benefits from it, even from a point of view of just not eating too close to bedtime. That's still a form of time restricted eating, which is also being clinically proven to improve sleep so just even if it's that one thing that's a benefit mm. um so i think it's I, I actually felt quite sad when i read that mm. and just before we move on to the next one what 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 is your aversion to oats <laughs> everything <laughs> oats are, i could answer this oats are really it's... personal right so some people they will spike there um, their blood sugar levels other people not so much yeah uh, you often find that even organic oats are covered in glyphosate oh dear um, and people don't tend to wash their oats before they eat them because they think well they've been milled they're ready to use it's mm. not something that you think so i think it can be a little bit hormone disruptive mm. and not good for the gut don't start on oat milk <laughs> then we're really not going to get off this discussion <laughs> you stand next to her in a, in a coffee shop and somebody <laughs> orders oat milk run for your life because she gets embarrassing <laughs> well, here in portugal you can buy oat milk which does not have any seed oils in it would you still have the same level of aversion to oat milk if it if it was seed oil free i personally would because i know oats for me spike my blood sugar and i get more there are more nutritional benefits in my opinion from cow's milk good quality organic non-homogenized cow's milk yeah yeah well it's a good reminder for me because being gluten-free there aren't always the amount of options that you can get yeah. elsewhere um and therefore oats sometimes seem like an easy win so thanks for the reminder another thing i can't eat brilliant <laughs> <laughs> Do you know if you're getting enough magnesium? Because four out of five people aren't. Interrupting the podcast for one moment to say, this is a big problem because magnesium is involved in more than 300 biochemical reactions in your body. And right now, I want to talk to you about the most common signs to look out for that could indicate your magnesium deficient. So are you irritable or anxious? Do you struggle with insomnia? Do you experience muscle cramps or twitches? Do you have high blood pressure? Are you sometimes constipated? There are loads of other symptoms, but those are just a few questions. And here's what most people don't know. Taking any magnesium supplement won't solve your problem. I've been trying out a few new electrolyte brands recently, and frankly, I've been shocked at how many of them use really suboptimal types of magnesium that is why in terms of magnesium i exclusively recommend magnesium breakthrough it's the only full spectrum magnesium supplement with seven unique forms of magnesium that your body can actually use and absorb if you go to bioptimizers.com slash zestology and use the code zestology10 you can get gifts with your purchase this month up to two travel size bottles of magnesium breakthrough so you can take it with you on your travels as well, especially if you go somewhere hot later on this year. So if you go to bioptimizers.com slash Zestology, this is a limited time offer. Use that code Zestology10. That works all over the world, works on the UK site as well, which is bioptimizers.co.uk. Remember to use that code Zestology10. And uh, remember, it is really important to make sure you're getting enough magnesium, but magnesium that you can actually absorb. That's it, back to the show. Now, there's this um, new app called Seed Oil Scout, and I know you guys are looking forward to looking at it, and I've, I've been reviewing it. What The concept is that it's an app designed to help you um, find restaurants cooking with healthy oils instead of seed oils, and it's a slick experience. I think in the tech world, you'd say the, um, the UX is very nice. Um, unfortunately, after attempting to use the app, in Portugal, I found there were zero restaurants nearby that were seed oil free. And then I found there were zero restaurants nearby. So then I tried, <laughs> so then I tried to use it in the UK. Um, and it also didn't seem to have many restaurants on it. So I think it might be US 
only at the moment. And I'm really hoping people who listen to this sort of get in touch if they've made it work, because I think it's such a great idea. But is it something when you, I mean, because I sort of feel like in London, for example, you guys are in London and over here as well. There is not at all a movement around seed oil free restaurants or organic food restaurants. I, I think that would be a brilliant idea for a restaurant, but maybe it's just so expensive that you can't do it. I would love this. When you said this app, I was like so happy with this because I just think, oh, I just had this really bad memory. We were going on holiday. We were, I know that he's for our Gatwick. And the kids wanted Wagamama, so I was like, fine, you know, for Waggers, how bad can it be? <laughs> and we were sitting up, and I turned and looked into the kitchen, and oh. they, thanks to God, one of my kids was like, I just, I've just spotted what you just spotted, because my face just dropped. And it was like a five litre container that just said rapeseed oil on it. And they were like, we're not going to be able to eat here, are we, mummy? <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you what my eldest oh. just sent me as a text message. Okay. Awesome. It will have seed oil in it, what she's about to go and get. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Yeah, and I think you... Well, it's the same with so many things, isn't it? Like so much stuff is branded as healthy. You think, well, Wagamama's, I don't want to call out Wagamama's because I do like Waggers, but, um, you know, versus McDonald's, say, you'd always choose Wagamama's. Um, but actually, you know, know. Tony's looking like maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not. you know, well, I mean, my, my local restaurant my local cafe here does a very good value omelette and salad for breakfast which is absolutely lovely and it's just sort of ticks all the right nutritional boxes except and i haven't dared ask i bet they cook it in seed oils mm. <laughs> yeah well yes it's cheap isn't it and so this is why restaurants well, yeah i was having another story i was in um can i just Put names of restaurants in. Of course that- you can. Get it in there. It's fine. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna get your Ivy. I'll get your podcast sued next time. <laughs> I was at the Ivy having breakfast and oh. I wanted to put a fried eggs on toast. And I said, What are you gonna use to fry the eggs in? And they were like, vegetable oil. Mm. And I said, Okay, could you use butter instead? And they just said no. <laughs> So I just said, don't worry about it then. <laughs> Was it the Ivy or the Ivy Cafe? That's the question. <laughs> the, I- the Ivy in Wimbledon Village. No, it's the cafe. So it's yeah. not the main not Ivy. Not the main one. Just... Yeah. Main Ivy would have been all right, I reckon. Yeah. 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 But it's things... Really things like that. Like you should be able to go to a cafe anywhere, fancy or not fancy, and say, could I have eggs cooked in butter? I I do think that the UK... Is so far behind mm-hmm. on this movement. Like you say, that apps in the US, food wise, there are way more <clears throat> organic restaurants in the US, cafes, you know, they're just in Dubai, Middle yeah. East, but they're just ahead of where mm. we are. One of the things that's interested me living here in Portugal is that here you can buy olive oil cooked crisps in yeah. almost every supermarket. And yeah. they're cheap as well. They're yeah. not like, you know, there's one brand that does it in the UK, isn't it? I think it's Torres. And it's yeah. basically four quid for a bag of crisps, isn't it? Whereas, yeah. yeah, here you can get them in every supermarket and they tend to be quite tasteless. They're carriers. You need a dip with them. <laughs> but it's yeah. great, you know, it's a quid for a big bag of olive oil crisps. I mean, it's not the healthiest snack, but it's slightly more healthy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Like whenever we go to Spain, I know that like the kids are like, you let us eat crisps when we go to Spain, but no. Not at home. Like, because I can't afford five quid a bag at home. Because <laughs> you're after school snacking, not a five pound bag of crisps, my dear. Bring <laughs> yourself back. <laughs> but no. I think, I can't remember where, where it was, but I did read something like in Italy, they, um, there was something like they banned other, started or starting to ban. I shouldn't say stuff that I can't that I can't cite, but there was a, there was an article that they were looking at banning um, other oils for snacks and things, and oh. maybe olive oil. So I think in the I think in the med anyway, there's definitely a push to using olive oil, isn't there? In a 
Yeah, yeah. I think generally speaking, it's a little, the cooking methods are a little bit healthy here, but I still don't know if my morning omelet is um, is cooked <laughs> in, in the right oil. Um, now, a couple of other stories we wanted to talk about. Firstly, a man who's just been announced as one of Dave Asprey's speakers at the, at the biohacking conference in Dallas, I think it is, at the end of May, start of June. Brian Johnson, you guys have been seeing him everywhere, and he's obviously now the headlining speaker at the biohacking conference in Dallas. What do you think of him? Well, we were just having this conversation. I mean, he is everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. My children, so I have an 18-year-old, she talks to me about him. I think, like we've just mentioned, what we are all trying to do is bring biohacking mainstream so everybody can access it and understand that the small incremental changes that you make will biologically reverse and also you'll lead what we're all striving for, a healthier, better quality of life. Mm. There are so many biohacks. I mean, we have a list of 26 that we do that you can stack, so it's not unattainable, but they're free or low cost. I think Mm. the problem we have with Brian Johnson is he's so far spent $6 million, which is a dip in the ocean for him when he you know, sold his business for $800 million. Yeah. Now selling this blueprint protocol for, I think the basic package is $333 a month of what can only looks like processed food. Um, well, it looks like he's selling products, not food. Not right? actual food. So he's not promoting right. like good whole food, you know, Mediterranean high olive oil diet. It's just, it's just products. Bagged powder. Yeah. And right. he's obviously done a lot of scientific research into the things that he can do to reverse his age, which he's done. And he looks about 12 now, but the thing is <laughs> one, they're not obtainable for yeah. the general public. So therefore keeping biohacking elitist the next yeah. year, yeah. just, And two, he doesn't have a life. And he openly admits he doesn't ever go out. He never eats past 11 a.m. in the morning. So his eating window must be minute. He schedules sex when he has a partner. (laughs) When he has a partner. That's the key. That's the key part. Yeah, well, it is the key part. Never. (laughs) If somebody's scheduling you in for sex, you're like, like, no, (laughs) no. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, I. I, it just it you we buy a hack to live better not yeah. necessarily longer but better for longer and he's sort he's, of wanting to stay alive forever right that's his sort well, of but main, in, a, in a creepy af way well we do we think he's creepy AF and that's just it but it also with really little enjoyment. I mean, you know, we rarely drink. We rarely, we, we, we don't, probably don't go out as many, as much as other people, friends, people our age. But when we do, we have fun, right? You've got to have a percentage of your life that, yeah, you know, so restrictive. And I think that's the scary thing with him, actually. It's the level of restriction. But I just, I just, just for people who don't know who he is, he's a tech founder and he's spending millions to be 18 again. He says his goal is to make death optional. Um, he takes 111 pills daily to receive, to achieve the results. His goal yeah. is to transform his 46 year old organs to function like those of an 18 year old. And you were saying the restriction is the problem. Yeah. Well, his semen is that of an 18 year old. The semen is a problem. This, this has been publicized. Like, why anybody wants to know about Brian Johnson's yeah. semen age is beyond, apart from his future baby carrier. I mean, I just. It, yeah, it, but I think too it's extreme. right. I think it, the restriction is. Um, I think restriction as a whole is quite a negative thing. Yeah. And it, it can lead to so many mind mental problems mental health issues and i think what he's really promoting is heavy restriction on fun heavy restriction on food heavy restriction on life sex (laughs) but he's Um, he's so extreme we've got to remember that we're building the world for the our children coming up into the world mm. like you say the mental health ocd would play a huge part in 
Yeah. In, this, in his in his defense, you know, he's he's the headline. He's one of the keynote speakers at the Biohackers Conference. He's going to have a huge audience. There's probably a lot of people who are very inspired by him. And it's not that different from what the likes of Dave Asprey's sort of always said slightly tongue in cheek. I want to live to 180. You know, it's sort of not that he's just taking it a bit further. I know what you mean about the restricted eating. And that certainly, you know, my sideline is the, the histamine intolerance site. And I do quite a lot of interviews on histamine intolerance now. And one of the main problems with that is that when people have really severe issues, they have to cut out a lot of foods and that does their head in because they're restricting so much. They just, it's sort of stressful and controlling to have to think about every meal. It's like me and my oat cakes today. If I've been able to have a slice of toast with four ingredients in it, that probably would have been fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but I think he's also I think just for us as well, we feel like like when we say biohackers, we don't see ourselves as like these science experiments. We see ourselves as like, are we getting enough sunlight? Are we getting outside on the grass? You know, let's incorporate some cold therapy, some heat therapy, but do it together and make it mm. fun. And it's like he is very much this science project in my view and I think it scares some people away from maybe trying to get involved a little bit in health optimization and I think that yeah I mean some of the stuff is interesting right he's pushing science to its limits which is great yeah so the only way you progress well he's an experimentation himself isn't he so we are learning from him but I, I think when you're it's in the news if it was in the news Brian Johnson science experiment for longevity. Fine. Mm. It's the, his attachment to biohacking is mm, yeah. it, it's in the media so much because he can pay so much yeah. money and he's got himself out there. Well, then it's wild. People... There's some of the shit that he's doing. I mean, it's, it's well, entertainment, mm. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like... yeah. He certainly put biohacking on the map. And it, yeah. it reminds me of when I got interviewed on radio one about biohacking fairly recently, a year or two ago. And I went in thinking they were going to talk about biohacking and they did. But then they started asking me about putting chips under your skin to pay for food and stuff like that. And I was like, that's not that's not actually what I think biohacking is. But I think everybody's definitions differ. Now, listen, I know you guys have got to go on the school run in about four minutes. So I've got a chance to ask you about one more story. A mood and health study um, across every country in the world found the second most miserable country in the world is the UK <laughs> for her based on where's the first? I think it was Uzbekistan was the most miserable. <laughs> um, so Portugal ranked about 30. I'm just saying I'm in Portugal. Um, UK was about 170. Um, and they found that the key factors for low ranking, sadly, <laughs> early age smartphone use, consumption of highly processed foods and loneliness now as a proud brit myself i know i don't actually live in in britain right now but i I sort of felt a bit sad about that and i'm not sure that i agree with it but do you guys it is sad i think no 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 do you think that we are the we are the second most depressive country on earth well i probably yeah because like (laughs) i said she's australian i went back to australia last this time last year i was in australia And it's like, it's so much easier to be happier there because you're outside more, the weather's better. You, so you naturally, you're naturally like improving your mood by being outdoors. Mm. I mean, are we removing all war-torn countries from this list? What planet are we on? We are the second as well, isn't it? Like you said, young smartphone usage, it's like, Probably people in less developed countries, although they don't have access to smartphones and things like that, they then don't have that stress of who's doing this on social media. Who, you know, the kids have this. They pressure. do have the stress of bombs dropping on them, though. So you know, there is. I that think is, the film that has not really looked at the world as a whole. That I is just, a very good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think there's so much horror going on in this world. We're an incredibly fortunate mm. nation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us of our biohacking privilege. I'm not actually even taking the piss then. You are, you are right. Um, and yet the top, the top couple of countries in the study were the Dominican Republic and Sri Lanka, which are, which are sort of by most economic standards, less developed and less well off than the UK. 
but didn't have these issues around smartphone usage and quite and loneliness in quite the same way. That makes me really sad. I'd like to be lonely sometimes because my kids never leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> it does make me really sad actually, because loneliness it's quite, is... different. it's quite different though. Like maybe people in those certain countries, like it's more culturally acceptable to live together as a family, multi generational. Yeah. Whereas like in the UK, it's really not. Like people live even within families quite separate, disconnected lives. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. We've always thought it'd be great if all our mates got a flat in the same block and then you'd have ready-made babysitters, you'd have a mate over for dinner every night and the, all the kids could play together. It'd be brilliant, wouldn't it? Why don't yeah. we do that? Well, you basically do <laughs> live here now. Now I've got the ice bar. We're going to buy oh. it the next in house. Yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah, I was so happy. We see, you I, are. Think, I mean, yeah, we are. I, I mean, I, I miss the sun. I'd like to be in the sun more often. And I guess it's quite a dark, wet, cold country. Yeah. I would like my eyes to see direct sunlight when I first wake. That doesn't happen. I'd like not to stand on soggy grass first thing in the morning. Doesn't happen. <clears throat> um, well, yeah. No, I think I, that's I why I said no, because having grown up in Australia. The, my mum's Australian too. Yeah. She would have also probably said. I still struggle like, over that over the winter period with not getting outdoors yeah, yeah. well so you two are both very upbeat if the, if you were a country in the mood and health study i'm sure you'd be very near the top <laughs> maybe oh. even ahead of sri lanka and the dominican republic uh, I'm going to let you go. Where can people obviously find your amazing podcast and everything that you do as well? Thank you so Thank much. You. So lovely to see you. Love to talk to you always. Yeah. But hang on, before you go, where, where can people find your podcast? Um, so we're on Instagram. We are at Sweaty AF podcast. podcast. Um, and we're also on uh, Spotify, on Apple Music and all those things. But mostly come find us on Instagram because that's where all our funny videos are. Brilliant, brilliant. And if not before, I'll definitely see you at the Health Optimization Summit in June. We're excited. Well. All right. Thanks for coming on. Cool. Thanks. Bye. Do you know if you're getting enough magnesium? Because four out of five people aren't. Interrupting the podcast for one moment to say... This is a big problem because magnesium is involved in more than 300 biochemical reactions in your body. And right now, I want to talk to you about the most common signs to look out for that could indicate your magnesium deficient. So, are you irritable or anxious? Do you struggle with insomnia? Do you experience muscle cramps or twitches? Do you have high blood pressure? Are you sometimes constipated? There are loads of other symptoms, but those are just a few questions. And... Here's what most people don't know. Taking any magnesium supplement won't solve your problem. I've been trying out a few new electrolyte brands recently, and frankly, I've been shocked at how many of them use really suboptimal types of magnesium. That is why, in terms of magnesium, I exclusively recommend Magnesium Breakthrough. It's the only full-spectrum magnesium supplement with seven unique forms of magnesium that your body can actually use and absorb if you go to bioptimizers.com slash zestology and use the code zestology10 you can get gifts with your purchase this month up to two travel size bottles of magnesium breakthrough so you can take it with you on your travels as well especially if you go somewhere hot later on this year so if you go to bioptimizers.com slash zestology this is a limited time offer Use that code ZESTOLOGY10. That works all over the world. Works on the UK site as well, which is bioptimizers.co.uk. Remember to use that code ZESTOLOGY10. And uh, remember, it is really important to make sure you're getting enough magnesium, but magnesium that you can actually absorb.